Hello everyone, my name is Annette Kühlem and I'm an archaeologist. What I do is landscape archaeology, so I look into um, the interdependencies of man and nature into ecosystems and how um, humans have changed them, have altered them, have needed to adapt to them, and the landscape transformation that often results out of that. All across the globe, there's a lot of areas where um, for the untrained eye, you think you are in nature and that you are dealing with um, untouched environments like, for example, the Amazon or the far-flung islands of the Pacific, where I usually work. Now that due to the uh, pandemic, we're uh, all pretty much uh, still banned from travel, um, I have made it as far as Lower Saxony, um, where um, I grew up, where my parents live. and. Um, I spent most of my childhood in West Africa, actually, and the summers I spent here in what I thought the beautiful nature of Lower Saxony. If you look at the landscape behind me, I am sure very few of us would say that this is nature. Obviously, we're dealing with a very domesticated landscape here. That's the product of hundreds of years of human intervention. Here, starting at a very high intensity in the 11th century, um, when much of the original uh, moorlands of the peat bogs were drained in order to make land for agriculture and for peat mining. While I'm sure we can all agree that this behind me is not something that we would call nature, if I just take you around to the other side of this little road here, this is something where I think much more of us at first glance would say, now this is nature, you got trees of different sizes, everything's green, you got your mosses, you got your understory, and you would consider this, yeah, to be forest in nature. But also this, the plantation of the pine trees, for example, is the product of hundreds of years of human landscape transformation and vegetation changes are a big part of that, as you can see here. But it is actually much more far reaching than this. And I'll take you along on a little tour, just basically around where I used to play as a kid to show you the landscape transformation due to that peat mining that was very intense in the area. The large scale drainage that happened all over this area had three major reasons behind it. One was to create land for agriculture and settlement. The other was um, for forestry, like the forest behind me, which is a huge plantation of pine trees that were used for building mainly, building of those um, typical lower Saxon timber frame houses. And uh, the third reason, which very much influenced the landscape, was peat mining, which was mainly used for fuel and heating. Right now we are in an area that used to be a peat bog and was subject to this intense drainage and um, afterwards was a peat mining area, which you can still see if you look around all those holes, those depressions that we used to think was just a natural feature of the landscape is actually um, a product of the peat mining. and. If you test the soil a little bit, the ground, it's still very, very bouncy. And that is because in the upper areas, you still have that peat. I'm going down into one of those uh, drainage trenches um, that crisscross uh, the landscape everywhere here in what now is a secondary forest and which were installed in order yeah, to drain the water out of these peat bogs in order to be able to access the peat. So I'm going to walk up into that drained area and I just want you to um, realize how behind me in the area where it hasn't been drained, the vegetation is a lot greener and a lot lusher even now. And now as I go up into the areas where the peat mining actually took place, it's a totally different vegetation, just having crossed one drainage trench. So this spot is one of the few peat 
box where you actually still have standing water. So this small area escaped this big drainage that happened all over the landscape here. And um, you'll see that the water is very dark. It's almost black. And that is again a product of that decaying organic matter. So after drainage, that same organic matter would then be harvested or mined uh, as peat brick. In olden days, the peat bogs, the moors in general, were very much feared by the local population. So the folklore has it that all sorts of evil spirits, um, the devil himself, resides in the moors, uh, in those uh, peat bogs. And so they were very much feared and people tried to not um, cross the moors, especially at night. So apart from those superstitions where the people feared evil spirits in the bogs, there's good evidence that it was actually dangerous for your physical health to come too close to bogs. You might have heard of uh, the bog people, and those are basically mummified human bodies, the earliest of which is 8,000 years old. Um, some of them are considered human sacrifices to probably appease those evil spirits that people associated with the bogs. But in other cases, it seems very likely that it was simply an accident and somebody got stuck in a bog or fell into a bog. And those um, cadavers are beautifully preserved. Um, so the um, acidic water and the anaerobic circumstances in the water um, preserve the organic material beautifully. So um, there are those thousand of year old bodies with hair, with clothing, some of them even uh, with um, cordage or something. So that is um, another aspect of why those bogs should be feared. This gentleman, known as the Tolland Man, was found in Denmark in 1950, and he is the most well-preserved of those bog bodies um, that we have in the archaeological record. Um, he has been C14 dated uh, to the 4th century BC. There are many questions about the Tolund man. Where was he from? Who was he? Why was he killed? Why was his body deposited in a bog? And for all of those, uh, there are scientific um, investigation methods to shed some light on all those questions. Right after Tolund Man was found in 1950, there was a normal um, autopsy done on the body because people were actually not aware that it was an uh, over 2,000-year-old human body. During the initial autopsy that was done in 1950 when Tol Lundman was found, we know the contents of his stomach and that tells us not only about what he ate, but also during what time of the year he met his death. The typical foods that you would expect to find in summer and autumn would be all sorts of berries, and fruits like apples and pears. But in the stomach of Tolund man, we only found barley, lime seed, and nut wheat, so typical winter foods. So that tells us that he died during winter time. There's a string around the neck of Tolund man that you can see very clearly still because also the material of that rope is so well preserved. And along with some marks on the back of his neck, this tells us that Tolland man met a violent death, that he was hung. Therefore, many scholars believe that the death of Tolland man was some kind of a sacrificial offering during a fertility ritual in the winter. Those were done in order to ensure the return of spring after the dark months. It is truly amazing how well the bodies of those bog people are preserved. It is fascinating how much information 
we as archaeologists get from those really human encounters with somebody from the Iron Ages. I'm sure we can all imagine that those poor peat cutters who came across one of those bog bodies during their work got a shock of their lifetime, often not realizing that the body they found was not a product of a recent murder, but in many cases thousands of years old. I'm sitting on a footbridge between uh, two of the small peat mines that you have all over the landscape here. And I think you can see it's basically four by five meters, each of those two rectangular pits on either side of me. Um, in the 1600s, uh, when uh, peat mining started in this area and all those bogs were drained, um, the area was extremely sparsely settled because it was not good land, either for agriculture or for settlements. So each individual household got assigned a certain parcel for peat mining. We are in the area where, as a child, I used to play all day long during the summers. And we would run around here and uh, build these kind of little huts that, uh, funny enough, I just found while walking around here. And um, I love it that it's obviously a thing that kids still do nowadays. But what I'm getting at is we would be playing outside amidst all these trees and the vegetation and we would have that feeling that we had been outside in nature all day. Um, what it turns out, once you get a little bit more of, uh, of an eye for what human landscape transformation is, you realize that this is a cultural landscape that has been altered and shaped by humans for centuries. So where I'm standing right now is inside one of the peat mines. So you can see the original surface um, right behind me. So it's a good meter that has already been extracted. And I cut a little profile just so we can take a look at the different layers. What is important to know um, about peat formation is that it only forms by the rate of one millimeter per year. So very, very slowly. And the oldest peat bogs um, that we have in, in northern Germany are 12,000 years old. So it is um, a resource that grows very, very slowly, but can be harvested at a pretty fast rate. What is peat and why was it such a valuable resource for people to put so much labor into harvesting and mining it? Basically, it is a decaying plant matter, organic material that forms in peat bogs. So underwater in anaerobic circumstances with no exposure to oxygen. It is basically on the way to carbonization. There are two grades of peat, and you can see that very well in this little sample that I have right here. Um, the upper, which is called white peat, um, is not as decayed yet, and so does not have as much carbon in it. This has been mainly used um, for bedding, for, uh, for cattle and horses in the stalls, and the lower part, the black peat, is what people were actually going for. The, that was um, yeah, taken out with spades and then uh, dried in bricks and then used for, uh, for fuel, for burning material, but also to insulate houses. Before that large-scale anthropogenic landscape transformation that happened here, especially in northern Germany, 1.5 million hectares of uh, the area of Germany was covered in moors or bogs, and 97% of that has been drained. It's hard to believe, but one hectare of peat bog can sequester up to 75 tons of carbon dioxide every year. Once those bogs are drained, slowly that carbon dioxide is being released into the atmosphere. So I hope this little excursion into the area where I used to 
play as a child and think I was deep in nature um, was something that opened your eyes a little bit to the degrees of landscape transformation that surrounds us all. And we often don't realize um, that this is the, what shaped the landscape. Um, and not only the landscape in the case of uh, peat mining, but also long-term and severe effects on our world's climate. And I hope this little pit I dug right here to demonstrate a little bit about the formation of peat um, does not affect my carbon footprint all too much. After all, this has been a year where that footprint has been very low in comparison. And um, due to the pandemic, we're all more homebound than we probably would like to be. But I hope we will all see each other somewhere around this beautiful world sometime soon.